Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you... I have godlike voice. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2014 Northwest Pinball and Arcade Show. I'm Dave Okert. I go by Doc. This is David Shoemaker. We call him Shoe or just about anything else. David. There's, there's too many Daves, and that's why we, we have our little nicknames. Uh, Doc is just short for Dave Okert. It's real easy. He who collects too much large stuff. <laughs> uh, this, this particular seminar is, is for my game is broken. Help, what do I do? Get the, your beverage of, of function. Your, your, your okay. beverage of yeah. choice. Note the, and I feel dirty yes, now. It, yes. <laughs> well, see, now if, I was, side, if I was drinking Coke, side. I would need something else to go with it. The, the first place to start with in any game repair is to have a manual. And if I had a whiteboard, which I thought I was gonna have, and I apologize for that, I fell down there. We would write down a bunch of websites for you folks. If you're working on a video game, uh, one of the best places for manuals is Arc Arc Mission. And that's, it's, it's just Arc like Arc, it's, one word, A-R-C, A-R-C, dot xmission dot com. They have almost, almost every video game manual and or monitor manual in PDF format. For the majority of the pinball machines, <coughs> the Internet Pinball <coughs> Database, IPB.org, has almost everything except for Gottlieb. Gottlieb's a special case. Gottlieb is owned all the rights to Gottlieb are owned by Steve Young, and that is Pinball Resource, pbresource.com. He will be glad to sell you a manual. He, he will be glad to sell you a manual. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking for ROMs or manuals for Gottliebs, you're going to have to pay the man's price. Uh, they just are not there. He, he's very active about protecting his IP. He bought it. Fair enough. He wants to make sure he gets his, his chunk of change out of it. Now, you, you did not hear this from me, but pin mame ROMs work in Gottlieb. So if you need a ROM and you know where to find pin mame, you can kind of usually work. Oh, man, who invited you? Now, the pinball and video arcade, essentially, they're the same. They have uh, the, what I like to refer to as the triangle. You have a power supply. You have a board set, and then you have a display. In a video game, the display is obvious. It's the monitor. It's the picture. <coughs> In a pinball machine, your display is anything. It could be your, your score display, or it could be your feature lamps. That's your display. It could be said that it's also your up kicks, your, your drop targets, and things like this. Sure. So uh, in that triangle, you need, one of, you need two of those three to be known good before you can fix the third. It's the, it's the easiest way. If you have two out of the three down, you're chasing your tail because this problem is causing that problem is causing this problem. Well, why doesn't it work? I don't know. That's why. Um. Um, okay, so you had a question about a haunted house. Okay, your ball's missing. All right, well. Knowing Haunted House, as I do, it's a tri-level, um, your ball is probably at the bottom. So if you have a multi-level pinball and you have a, a ball missing, look to where the gravity's gonna take it first. Uh, it's designed, gravity's gonna take it into the, into the trough. Uh, if you've got, like Haunted House, where it's got a, a lower level and it actually has to kick back out, that's probably where it is, and more likely than not, you've got a blown up kicker solenoid driver. So it's not, reject, it's not kicking the ball up onto the play field and coming down. Uh, I know this because, well, mine burned up. I've, I've seen this more than once. On fire. Um, on, yeah, fire. fire, fire, fire. Uh, if you have a machine with drop targets, check behind the drop targets. It's, they're never supposed to end up behind the rubber. They do sometimes. Um, I've seen things jammed up under the, the, the rebounds uh, where the ball just came in, went over the rubber, and it's stuck in there. Um, so. Yes, uh, game's dead, and I don't know what's going on. Um, well, so pinball, you've got those, you've got these, fairly simple. With that, 
Now you'll get uh, very commonly, somebody will call me up and say, my game doesn't work. Well, okay, what's it doing? Well, it's making noise. Okay, is there anything on screen? No, so it's playing blind. Okay, that tells you something. You probably have a monitor problem. Not always. There are certain strange cases where your game board has stopped putting out video, but more often than not, the monitor has failed. That's a whole other weekend worth of seminar. <laughs> um, with that, you, if you don't feel comfortable playing around things that can kill you, give one of us a call. Um, the monitor has voltages that can actually kill you. You want to be very safe. It, you can do work on them safely. We do it all the time. We, we do want to say, uh, and from both of us, that uh, safety is paramount and it is no joke. Uh, we, we take extreme measures for safety. There is no need to uh, put on your uh, rubber gloves and your leather gloves and uh, all that kind of good stuff uh, to, to be safe about this. It's, it's silly and unnecessary. You just do need to be aware of the different voltages. And again, this comes back to, to why you have a manual. One of the things that, let's open this head here. This is, uh, this is a Flash Gordon <clears throat> trashed unit. Next year, uh, this will be gorgeous like this Xenon. And that's gonna be coming up in the later seminars. In your solenoid driver board uh, on this old belly, this is another part of the power supply. There's two parts to this power supply. There's the power brick, which is down inside in the cabinet. And in some cases, your power brick will sit right here. In most of your cabinets, it's gonna be in the bottom. And that's your isolation transfer, with a big transformer in the bottom. But this particular solenoid driver board, in this section where this little plastic guy is missing, is where the 230 volts DC for these displays lives. And nine out of 10 of these that you'll open up, this plastic piece will be missing, and so will the sticker that says, caution, caution. <laughs> high voltage. So there are test points throughout, and that, again, back, that referencing back to the manual, they're, they're very, these are not difficult to read. Help, my game doesn't work. If you do not have one of these or know how to use one of these, call us because you're not qualified. I'm not trying to insult anybody, but if you don't understand this, everything in here is dangerous. There be dragons who want to bite you. We will be glad to teach. It's one of the things we love to do. This is the next seminar. Yeah. Um, these are like underwear and religions. Everybody should have one, and you probably don't want to share because they're all a little different. <laughs> yeah, meters are all different, and it's kind of funny because I have three different meters that I use. Why do I have three different ones? I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I have one that has really big <clears throat> numbers on it, and that's just so that I can see it because I'm kind of, you know. Old? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Diss my game, <clears throat> I'm going to Hey, hey yeah. rock on. It's on you. <laughs> Yeah, you're not much older than me. Um, so, um, well, I guess we can kind of go through. This is my portable kit. This is not everything I own. I own huge amounts of tools and equipment. Um, this is what I take when I'm going to somebody's house. Um, flashlight, yes. Uh, it's dark in these holes. Uh, yeah. I've got more than one. Um, the meter, I've got various screwdrivers, uh, I've got crimpers, strippers, and so on, so I can do um, minimal repairs on site. Um, soldering iron. If you don't know which end to hold, call us. We'll be glad to teach you. Um, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that plug for in the bottom of my pinball cabinet? There's, a, there's an outlet in the bottom of my pinball cabinet. No, you can't cabinet. plug the pin into it. It doesn't work that way. What's that plug for? It's for this. Because soldering is very common under a play field, and you don't want to have to do it out here. Um, that outlet, by the way, is live when the switch is off. 
So if you think, oh, I'll turn it off and my soldering iron will cool off, no, it won't. You're going to get burned. Um, Let's see, anything else that's really oddball in here? Um, no. Um, you'll run into, I've got um, Allen drivers for hex heads. Uh, security bits are a fairly common problem in a lot of games. Um, Torque, Torque security bits are, uh, they look like an asterisk with a, a, a point sticking out of the middle. And what those were for, the Torx security bit, were so that the average Joe couldn't come up, take your screws out, and steal your stuff. Uh, they're kind of a, a pain nowadays. Uh, um, I take mine out. Yeah. Uh, oh, they, I got they, it out. they can be right. Yay, I got it out. They can re be replaced <clears throat> with uh, regular screws. If you have the Torx security bits, Harbor Freight sells a little block, and it has every Torx security bit. And Allen the bit, Allen security bits. Robertson bits. Uh, Rob Robertson Rob. bits uh, confuse a lot of people. They're commonly used in Canada. They're a diamond-shaped bit. And the, the reason well, that Robertson square. bits were, were used, yeah, square, diamond, I like to say diamond. Rhombus. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're special. Uh, the reason they were, they were used a lot is because, well, people don't have those bits. Uh, you Here, commonly, you commonly see them uh, in restrooms that are holding the walls together. Uh, they're, they're used in deck screws. So you, you can get a Robinson yeah. bit at Home Depot, Lowe's. There's no big deal there. Um, so that's basic tooling. Well, let's, uh, stay, let's, well, the, let's take it to the crowd. What do you got? Well, I was going to go one step further. Do it. So that, that's the basic toolkit. Then this is my monitor box. <clears throat> so that game plays blind. Well, I come in and I say, okay, let's check it out. Now this is where we start getting into the specialized equipment. This is a signal generator for monitor testing. It puts out a set of color bars and various other pieces so I can verify that the monitor has display. Uh, if I go into a game that's not working, I put this on, it still doesn't work, okay, that monitor is bad, we're gonna go from there. Um, a lot of games have a test mode to go in for coloring adjustments. Um, uh, let's see, and then it all gets into fiddly bits in here. Uh, now, now that you brought up monitors, we wanna, we wanna talk about some of the uh, Nintendo games, Sanyo monitors. Uh, if you look inside of Sanyo most, or most uh, Nintendos, such as Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Donkey Kong 3, Mario Brothers, what you'll see in the bottom of the cabinet is you'll see that the monitor has a two-prong plug that's plugged into an outlet in the bottom of the cabinet. What is significant about that is that those monitors run on 100 volts AC versus 120 volts AC. Uh, there's a Same. <laughs> and you will spend months trying to figure out what component you've blown in there because it is never the same. I've, I've seen 10 of them plugged into a wall outlet. All 10 of them didn't work afterwards and none of the problems were the same. Isolation transformers uh, are the big power brick in the bottom and that's what they were there for was to isolate the monitor from power spikes and things like that. I do a lot of these. I bring my own isolation transformer because I've got to be sure that the thing's set up correctly. Uh, Shu and I just recently learned that um, <laughs> yeah. after, you know, <clears throat> I, I've been doing this for 27 years and he's right there at the same level, uh, if not a couple of years more than me. Uh, we both recently learned that 25-inch um, monitors, uh, standard resolution, require an isolation monitor or isolation transformer, I'm sorry. And if it's not there, it blows the monitor. So um, when you're swapping out a monitor, you need to verify that the monitor that was in there did have an isolation transformer in the cabinet. Does the new monitor require an isolation transformer? The last generation of monitors made had the isolation transformers built into the monitor. 
If you have more than one, that's okay. If you don't have any, you got problems. Mm -hmm. So when you're swapping a monitor, you need to make sure that there is an isolation transformer somewhere in the system for the monitor or you're gonna blow something up or hurt yourself. Um, there actually, there's a safety mechanism. It, it, it breaks the, the, the ground loop uh, possibility. So you touch the screen and the coin door, you're not gonna get zapped. The good, the good way to go is to always put in an isolation transform, and then you don't ever have to worry about it. Questions? Who's got yeah, Twilight Zone? What's, what, what's up with your Twilight Zone? My Twilight Zone being, uh, well, except it's just a very simple fix for the first part. The little batteries were gone behind the uh, back part. <clears> so <throat> that just took me a whole nine seconds. Okay. Oh, stop, 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 stop. Let's, let's talk about batteries. You brought up batteries. Batteries. Okay. Batteries are batteries. evil. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Write this one down. All right. Pin four. What? Pardon me? You said what? Pin one? Pin forge. F-O-R-G-E dot com. They sell an NB RAM adapter. And it's sold in the United States by... Uh, Big Daddy, whatever, Big Daddy Pinball, Enterprises. Big Daddy Enterprises, thank you. They cost you $25. It's a board about this big. And it's called a what? NVRAM. NVRAM. Non-volatile RAM. Okay, this NVRAM, matter of fact, Rob Anthony has some upstairs uh, at Lock One Lit, and these things, we'll go ahead and pass these around. Uh, Rob Anthony's NVRAM, I think they're $35, something like that. They, he sells them for $35. His are a little more versatile. They do uh, 5101 replacements, 6116s. What the batteries in a pinball machine do are, is they keep power to your CMOS, your memory. That keeps all of your settings. Your high scores, your... You know, if free you're play on free settings, play, if you know, yeah, um, it, the audits for the game—that's what the, those are for. And the batteries are there to keep them. They, it's, when you turn Just, the machine off, it's got to keep a little trickle going. You, you, you need ramp. three volts of power to maintain that. And nine times out of ten, the first thing that happens is somebody's got their their pinball and they haven't changed their battery out in six months, a year, five years since I owned it. Fifteen. <clears throat> and, they, yeah. and they start leaking acid. As soon Actually, as, they leak alkaline. Uh, alkaline, excuse me. Yeah. But you have to neutralize yeah. it differently. It gets underneath the traces. And Batteries in, are in your newer evil. pinballs, the, the WPC traces are about as thick as a hair. And so when it gets under that trace, you just can't find it. And, and so now your game doesn't work. Um, with, the, with these NVRAM adapters, you install one socket, you pull out the CMOS chip, you remove the battery holder altogether, throw it in the trash, put this in, and you never have to replace your batteries ever again. These things are awesome, they're worth the money. Um, there are some video games that these will work in, um, Robotron, things like that. Uh, if he uses the, 50, the 5101, this, these can replace that. Um, on a Robotron yes. st uh, Stargate Defender, you can also replace the three AA batteries with what's known as a lith mod. Or you, they, they will take one of those as well. Yeah, they will. They will. Sure. Uh, but that's more work than replace the, the lith mod. Yeah. Um, that replaces it with a CR2032 coin cell. Um, when those go dead, they don't leak. They don't last as long but it is not as bad. Now, if you have a Tron or a Spy Hunter, <clears throat> you can do that same mod, but you have to use a, there's a, you have to use a diode instead of a wire, otherwise the game's gonna try to recharge the battery and gonna, it's gonna go pop. That's gonna be bad. Um, a Tron, a Satan's Hollow, any of that era, when those, they had a, a single battery on the power supply, and it was a NICAD, and it failed and it leaked and it ate the bottom quarter of the board. Um, oh, hey, wait a minute. I knew I brought the, your pin for a reason. Other than a diss me? 
and an old belly in a dash 35, <clears> dash 17, or a stern 200, stern 100, right where my finger is, is where that NICAD battery was. Yeah. And you will commonly see that these boards are just totally eaten on the bottom. And the alkaline and whatnot will actually leach up into uh, your 5101 CMOS RAM. It'll also leach up into the 6810 uh, RAM. And this whole reset section will be bad. Yeah. Um, it's also a joy because if you have, say, a uh, baby pack, baby pack uh, hybrid uh, video pin, the, uh, the, the, the battery goes bad, the fumes that it's ex exhausting are heavier than air, it flows down the board below it, eating it up. 50% um, of the time, the board can be repaired. It's a lot of work. It's going to cost a bit to do so. Um, it can be done sometimes. Um, there are aftermarket reproductions for most all these at this point. They cost almost as much as this pin's worth in some cases. Well, in this shape, yeah, about as much as this pin's worth. Well, you, 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 have, to, you have to determine what, you, what your machine is worth to you. The, this, this board can be, re, the CPU can be replaced with an Alltech on this particular generation for $200. Uh, the solenoid driver mm. board is $150. The lamp driver <laughs> board, which you need if you want to put in LEDs so that they don't ghost, runs $100. Uh, and then, of course, you, you, the replacement sound boards, I'm not sure if those are done yet. I, don't I know, know they were working on them, but I don't think yeah. they're done yet. And... Uh, and then, of course, the, the replacement, there's another power supply that sits down on the power brick, goes about 80 bucks, depending on the generation. So if you want to bring a old machine like this up to mo current, using modern equipment, you can spend $500 on a $400 pin. And then that doesn't even go into play field or back glass or anything like that. You can make a $2,000, $400 pin really easy. Uh, when, you, when you upgrade to the NVRAM, you need to make sure that you know which CMOS your particular pinball machine uses. Uh, some of them use 5101. Uh, most of the System 11 and later use 6116. And when they get into <coughs> WPC, they use 6264. Um, Getting the right Much part. different. Yeah. At the the NVRAM, make it makes a slight difference there. Yeah, the, the socket can be different, the little bit of, the, the daughter board's gonna be slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, we, had a, we had a question in the back, gentleman in blue. Yeah, uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you know the, do you know the make and model of the monitor? <coughs> <coughs> Okay, if it's a 7500, it's not a standard res. Okay, it's not a 7500. Okay, 7400 probably. 70... Okay. <laughs> that sounds right. In the, in, the, in the 25 inch K7000 series, with the. common cause of vertical collapse is due to the uh, one watt or larger resistors failing. It could, be, it could be as simple as a cold solder joint or the resistor itself is open. There's only five, maybe six of those resistors. The, the bigger one. It, it's obvious when you look at the board that the size of the resistor is considerably larger. Gen generally they, speaking, you're look, you want to be looking back in the area of the fuse. Uh, right back where, by the, in the back where the fuse is, there's probably, that's probably one of the largest ones. I think that's a yeah. five watt, might be a three watt. That one comp On that, so the back half of the board, it, there's a power supply is to the left. Um, then the, the rest of the circuitry comes around, fly back. Um, it, it's kind of in quadrant. Supply, fly back, horizontal, vertical. Um, the resistors that are jumping the, the quadrants, basically, 
use just use your meter, anything. If you, you can't verify a resistance in place. You can verify an open though, in most cases. So you put your, your meter on resistance, check it. If it comes up with something that's closest to what it's supposed to be, it's probably fine. If it, within, the, the general rule of thumb is within 10%, plus or minus. If it shows as an open, <clears throat> then yeah, you, you, found a, you probably found the bad resistor. Uh, do not do this with the monitor on. That will give you bunk readings, readings and it might just zap your ass. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are other cases where you're gonna need to test things with it on, like if you're checking voltages and so on. Um, but just if you're checking resistance, uh, you don't worry about it. Vertical collapse on those can be a bit problematic. I'm running a pair of 7500s with a vertical collapse that I'm still fighting with that I haven't quite figured out what's going on. Uh, I hate monitors. That's why I got Question, four. Dennis? Um, that's, that's, there's that's, a question. That's a trick question. <laughs> First answer is no. The last foundry for tubes closed down about two and a half years ago. Nobody in the world is making tubes anymore. There, there was a worldwide consortium that had to do with lead in cathode ray tubes. So they just said, ah, there's no point. They just shut down the manufacturer. Uh, they wouldn't be making tubes. They're, that's, that's, everything's that, LCD. That's, that's LCD. Has to be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's not cathode ray tubes. Yeah. It is. It, well, it is oh, a glass. Yeah. The, the, it's the, not the big glass tube. Okay. So nobody's making those. The now LCDs or plasmas or the various sundry incarnations, they are still making those. They're, they're making lots and lots of those. The thing of it is, this runs 320 by 200 resolution. That's a resolution they, they used 35 years ago in computer monitors. They never advanced past that really for video games. So you try to buy a monitor, uh, an LCD, it's almost always gonna be at least 720. Usually it's 1080 because it's a TV basically. That's four times the resolution. So you need an adapter board to take the signal from the game, run it through this adaption, and then display it. There, there that else. works, but it drives certain purists insane. I was pointing it for a reason. Um, the pixels are too crisp. You don't get the color bleeds, which were actually designed into the art in some cases because they knew how it was gonna display. So you could do certain color blending. So it looks odd to somebody who's really familiar. Uh, it's not a horribly expensive process to put in an LCD in. Um, there's a $30 board you can buy on eBay. It usually works. It's cheap Chinese crap, so sometimes it doesn't always work. Now, you, you cannot mm -hmm. throw in any LCD. You can't go to Walmart and grab an LCD off the shelf and throw it in there. The reason you cannot do that is because of what David's talking about, is where uh, the minimum resolution is 720 dot pitch. Well, the frequency of that particular one is 73 hertz. Uh, the game board is expecting a signal of 15 yeah. kilohertz. So, CGA resolution, standard res, is 15 kHz. Um, medium resolution in arcade games is 25. High resolution 50, I believe, I'm not, I don't remember off my head. Yeah. And then, then, okay, ah, well, okay, Seawolf's even diff, more interesting. Seawolf's black and white. <laughs> okay, okay, so a Seawolf or Space Invaders, um, if the monitor is bad, it's not impossible to repair those. They're a little more. Uh, he doesn't even do it much. Um, <clears throat> but they can be done, uh, usually. If it can't be done, you can find a monitor from a Burger Time, a Pac-Man, something like that, and with a little bit of finagling, you can use a color monitor in a black and white game. 
Uh, the, you basically the, run... The, the simple difference there, Dennis, is that, is that a color monitor has three guns. It has red, green, and blue, whereas a black and white essentially has a red gun. Yeah. So you can, you can tie that one to all three colors. You'll get white. Works out. Um, or you can hook them all to blue, and that looks kind of cool. Uh, the Space Invaders look good as red. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah, no, no. Um, Just saying. I, I'm not a purist. I've given up on some of the, uh, just because of practicality. I've got, my collection is over 200 games, um, about 10% of which are pinballs. I've got 2,000 boards. Trying to keep all this stuff working identical to stock will cost me forever. Um, so I do take a few expedients. Uh, I have some machines upstairs that I'm like, okay, after the show, I'm done with these monitors. I'm tired of these things. It's a bunch of LCDs. But those are medium resolution games. 25 inch monitors or 27 inch monitors. I switch those out to an LCD. 39. 39 for the pod racers. 50 inch for the Star Wars trilogy. That's, that, that's a big ass projection TV. That thing's failing, it's out. That's an LCD going in there. Yeah, it'll be different, it'll look a little different, but it'll work. And that's the thing, I, I want these to be playable. Uh, it'll also be much crisper, which is really not a bad thing for that projection TV. That, that was a horrible technology to be using. <clears throat> Just so you know, the time is 2.30. Yay, oh! we have a cuckoo clock in the back. <laughs> I'm still wondering about that. Um, that means we need to move into next. Okay. Rock on. Start. <laughs> yeah. uh, so as as we as we cut our time a little little long and a little short, uh, we anticipated that that uh, this was going to happen, but we were trying to get in uh, more information for those who wanted the information. Uh, one of the things that we went out with. Uh, to the local pinball collecting community and the local video arcade collecting community earlier this year was what information do you folks want to see? What, do you, what can we tell you? What can, what can we help you with? And uh, part of that came from uh, something that we do called repair parties. And that's, I started that about six or seven years ago uh, because of the show. He got tired of fixing everything that was going wrong at the show, at the show. I'm one man, two hands, and I'm broken and crippled, and uh, yeah. Old, ugly. Yeah, yeah old, ugly, the yeah, list goes on. <laughs> uh, and so what repair parties are for us are uh, within the local collecting community, and uh, they used to be, all be at my house, was uh, if you have a broken piece or whatever, you bring it over and I will show you how to fix it. Uh, I will not fix it for you. Uh, if I have the parts and you can't find them, I will loan them to you and you replace them. Uh, you don't pay me for them, you replace them because they came out of my stash. And uh, there's, there's one big rule. If you got this thing on Craigslist last night for 50 bucks and we help you fix it and you put it on Craigslist tomorrow for 300, you don't get to come back. Ever. We're not going to help you flip your games. We're here because you wanted to learn this stuff, we wanted to help you, and we want these things to stay in our community. I'm not here for you to flip it with, yeah. on my labor. I, yeah, I'm willing to teach you. I want to teach you. I will be glad to charge you for the repair if you need me to do so. But that's, I consider it a last resort. So. Repair party is not a flipping station. We had it happen a couple times, and those people don't come back. So I did bring a couple of props, and uh, people are free to come up and, and check these out. Anybody that's, that's not familiar with this, uh, what this is, is this is an interconnect board for System 11. What System 11, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you really must know, it's an Elvira. Okay. For those of you who are on the vid size, <clears> the <throat> System 11 pinball machine. And one of, the, one of the most common problems is, uh, on these is your general illumination circuit runs through this thing. And your general, general illumination on a pinwall machine are the lights that are on all the time, no matter what. Okay? Well, 
They can be shut off by computer control in some machines. A Very, flashing of the whole play field. Fa fairly rare, but most of the time they're, they're on all the time. And, you know, pinball's been around for oh, about 100 years. And they haven't figured out that if you put too many lamps on one circuit, it burns <coughs> up. Stern still does it today. Uh, more lamps. More lamps. It's more better. Uh, the nice thing about, go, about, the, about pinball converting over to uh, LEDs are that LEDs in the first generation take an eighth of the power. Now that they're into the second, third, fourth, and fifth generation, they're approximately a tenth of the power. And so they don't burn up near as much, near as frequently. They also don't generate near the heat into the back box or the play field. If you get an old pin, and it's not uncommon to see at the slingshots that plastic being warped because the lamps are under there on all the time. These are GI lamps, and they're just little space heaters, and they're melting those plastics. One of the, one of the first things that, that everybody asks us is, such and such is not working. And the first thing that I say is, well, did you check the fuse? Looks good. Yep. Checked it. No, you didn't. Well, yeah, I did. I, it, it looks good. No, you didn't. And then, and then the next step is that they will, and of course, my, my meter is, is for the blind. It beeps when there's a connection. It's yeah, good. It's good. No, you didn't. You did not check that fuse. These two fuses are tied together. So if either one of them is bad and you put your meter on there, they'll both read good. The only proper way to check, to check one of these fuses, I kick Don't it Don't use the meter probe. I didn't bring the little screwdriver with me. Lift one side. Now, you've tested the fuse. Okay, fuse is still good. Um, uh, it, well, it, 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 it means that there's it, it means an oxidation. That I'm very shaky, and, I, and that's, that's what it means, is I'm yeah. shaky. Um, if you have trouble reading the fuse, it doesn't seem to want to make a connection, it's a bad fuse, even if the wire is good. The, Casing of the outside has started to oxidize. Electricity doesn't want to go through the oxidation. Throw the fuse away, put a new fuse in. What, what David's getting at there is your, your machine might play fine for a few minutes, and then all of a sudden it doesn't play. Fuse reads good for a few minutes, and then it doesn't. Um, Just oxidation. At the same time, it is heating. Uh, that will, it is not uncommon in an old machine to find the fuse blocks basically molten. Um, replacing fuse box blocks is very common on certain machines. Um, as the oxidation starts, the resistance goes up. More current has to go through, causes higher heat dissipation, which causes more oxidation, and you get into a vicious cycle of burning up this part. Um, or it's somewhere near where a battery was that is leaked and you got oxidation from that. If, if your GI has burned up on you, and you say, hey, my connector is all burnt and crispy. Oh, I need a new one. And I put a new connector on there, and well, let's see, it only worked for a week. Why was that? Because you only replaced half the problem. You replaced, well, depending. If you replace this side, but not the other side, half the problem. You replace the other side and this, not this side, half the problem. You really want to replace them in pairs. Uh, it's not uncommon that they used uh, a pin that was shaped basically like this, and you have that much connection point, okay? If you are replacing these, uh, this is known as a Molex 156 connector. They, Molex made a different type of pin called a Trifuricon, which has this portion, but it also has two wings. So you're actually wrapping three sides of the pin. Um, these are also using square pins. So you're actually getting nice, big connection patches. Not, putting, um, not trying to put a round peg in a square hole. Yeah, which and make a connection. Robotron, Stargate, Defender, Joust, all those did exactly that. 
They used the single wipe pins with round pins. It is not uncommon to pull the connector that is brown. The nylon connector is brown. You pull it off of the power supply and you see that that pin has a chunk melted into it from this little tiny contact patch that was supposed to drop 20 amps. Didn't do it that well for that long. Um, the manufacturers did never, ever expect this show to ever happen 30 years after they made these games. They were never planned for it. Um, Molex says the average life of these connectors is 20 insertion cycles. That's 20 times you plug it in, take it off. That was their entire design life. Yeah, they, these aren't designed for what we're using them for. We, we, we could do that in a day. Uh, the, next, the, the next area that we get into are, are diodes. And on, on your meter, if your meter doesn't have a diode function, you need to uh, get a better meter. need to get a better meter. Need to Radio spend, Shack need, has need, halfway need, decent need to spend meters. a couple more bucks. The diode function um, looks like an, an arrow and it has a line. That's your diode function. Diode function is going to be very, very important whether you're, whether you're working on a video game or whether you're working on a pinball. Lots uh, of diodes in pinball. Lots of diodes on pinball. And uh, the one thing about diodes uh, on your coils for your pinball flippers, switches, your switches targets, targets. They're, they're all over the place. They're all over the place. A lot of times in your, when, you're, when your coils go bad, you, you have a bad diode. The only way to truly test that diode on a coil is to actually remove the diode. Because one side, it, you don't remove both. If you, if, you don't, if you don't at least take off one side, you're going to read through the coil. And it's always going to tell you that that diode's good. It's like no testing what. the fuse. You can't really Sand do it. it in circuit. But the thing um, about diodes is that they cost about a penny. So if I've got to pull it off to test it, why don't I just throw it in the trash and replace it anyway? I mean, I can test it before I throw it in the trash, go, oh, well, it really was bad, or, oh, well, it was good, and that's not it, and still throw it in the trash because it's a penny. And you have to solder it back anyway. It doesn't hurt to change um, that diode. Yeah, we can go into the whole <clears throat> meantime to failure philosophy. But uh, um, So the, the cool thing about bridge rectifiers and now, diodes, just, diodes work into bridge rectifiers because there are four, four diodes, diodes in a bridge in rectifier. Bridge. And uh, if it was at, in a full wave bridge rectifier. Half wave has two. Half wave has two. Uh, <laughs> what I'd like to bring for a demonstration are, this is a power supply out of a Defender. And the reason I like to bring this one. Note the round pins I was talking about. Is because it has three different bridge rectifiers on it. And they're all full wave. Uh, this big square right here is a 3502. It, which means it's a 35 amp, 200 volt uh, bridge rectifier. And let's see, and then this, this, it has an inline one. The inline one is a 12 volt. And then it's got this little. Tiny, little, round, cute little baby one. Little uh, tiny. WGO3, I believe, is that one? Uh, no, that's an Alpha 161. All right, then you it's, it. that is a That one provides your negative 5 volts. And uh, for some reason, bridge rectifiers, again, that uh, comes back to the diode thing, it stumps people. And I have, a, I have a YouTube video on this particular power supply, how to test these. You test them out of the system, go ahead and flip it over, and we'll come up and test this. And it, you guys can come on up and check out the diode thing. You can play with my meter. It's all good stuff. Um, but it's, it's very simple. What I'm going to do is I take my negative lead. And every one of these bridge rectifiers has one positive lead. The other, it has one positive lead, two AC leads, a negative lead. and a negative lead. So your positive and negative will be diagonally across from each other. Your two ACs will be diagonally across from each other. The positive lead is always marked or uh, the leg could be shifted in an opposite direction of the other legs, yeah, just for simple identification. 
Yeah, and this one's marked. It's also, it's hard to see, but it's four paddles. One of them's 90 degrees from the other. That's your positive lead. Uh, it's almost always marked. The others may or may not be. It is marked on this one also. Um, okay. So the, you're going to take your negative lead and put it on the positive. You'll take the positive lead and run it to either AC. Okay, and on either AC, it should read between four and 600 on your meter. If it does not read between four and 600 on your meter, it's bad. It, if it's shorted, it's bad. And that's one half of that bridge rectifier. To read the, one the, quarter. the second half, you're going to, you're checking that's your first half. Yeah. That's your first half, here and there, that's your first half. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, then you'll take your positive lead and go to your negative side, and then the negative will go to the ACs. That'll make up your other two diodes for your full wave. Um, <clears throat> if we had a whiteboard, we could draw one. It's yeah, it's, it's very simplistic. Um, so that measurement, so the four to 600, it's, it's actually measuring what's known as the diode drop. The diode is designed to only let current go through one way, and you get five volts in, at the other side, you're gonna have a diode drops worth of change. It'll be, be 4.3. Um, so that's basically measuring that drop. If you reverse the meters on a diode, it should always show infinite because it shouldn't allow anything back through. Um, there's caveats for zener diodes and things like that, but uh, if you're starting to get into that, you're either really wanting to learn about electronics or you're curious, which is good. Anybody want to come up and play with the, the bridge rectifiers meter? Check it out. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> cool. I'm good with it. Okay. Any questions? Wow. Lively, John. Um, let's, talk about, let's talk about flipper coils. Flipper coils. When uh, I get called down to a place that I've got, I've got some pins at, and they tell me the flippers aren't working. Okay. Well, the first thing that the first thing that you want to check on your flippers is you want to verify that the <laughs> flipper is actually not mechanically frozen. If it's mechanically frozen, the coil has melted, or something has broken. Link could be broken. There's yeah. a couple. More likely than not, the coil has gotten hot, is swollen, and it's just seizing. Yeah, if it's if it's frozen in any way, shape, or form, uh, yeah, then we then we start in the mechanicals and work into the electricals later. And then, of course, a lot of times, um, I've I've been down recently where I had to uh, replace a fuse. And it was only one side of the flipper. It was the System 11. It was Elvira and the Party Monsters. The right flipper, they kept calling me down saying the right flipper is not working. I go down, the fuse is blown, replace the fuse. Everything's happy. Stay for a couple hours. Everything's good. Next day, they call me back. It's blown again. And what it turned out to be was that the end of stroke switch, one of the contacts um, had actually broken off. And so it wasn't, you weren't able to see it. And what happens with, with a flipper is that there's uh, the high side and the low side of the coil. When you first press your button, the high side lifts the coil up. As soon as the coil hits the end of stroke, the end of stroke switch opens, and then the voltage is cut in half, or even a little bit less, depending about on 20, 26 volts, depending on the game, uh, just to maintain holding the flipper up. And if that, if that doesn't happen, uh, then you're still applying the, the full power, which is often how up. you end up with the cooked coils in the first yeah. place. 50 to 75 volts, uh, which blows your fuse and or cooks your coil. Pardon? For not WPC, did WPC, they use a different system, which is, uh, what did they do? Fliptronics. Yeah, the Fliptronics. Fliptronics, yeah. a little bit different than WPC. Yeah. Um, those, usually the little board goes bad. Yeah. And that's, 
But again, you still, even, even in WPC, you still need to first start and verify that, you, that your uh, coil is free, the armature moves freely. Yeah, you should be able to, 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 oh, uh, speaking of coils, and going back to voltages, coil voltages bite. Um, and it is very common that when you've got the game on, play field up, there's live voltages under there. Uh, you actually need that in some cases to test things. Uh, some machines have an interlock when the coin door is open, it'll shut off the... All, all newer Sterns and a lot of WPs, WPCs. Yeah, they'll like shut that. down that. Of course, you can't test what you're trying to, so you end up closing the coin door with the play field up, and now you're going to get bit if you're not careful. Um, it, that's probably not a fatal voltage, but you'll know. Um, they, do, they do make a clip for that, and I, I'm not sure who's... It, they, came, they originally came with the game, and through the years, operators and owners have lost one. them. And, uh, but they, they make a little clip. It's a little plastic guy. You just slide it over that, and it's, that's what it's for. It's for service and troubleshooting. I don't know if Marco sells those, but they probably do. Still sell them, so. uh, yeah. Yeah if, yeah, if they don't, Bay Area probably does, yeah. I just close the door again. Duck, or electrical tape. <clears throat> um, so when you're, you're, you're checking out the, the, the coil, reach up there, manually diddle it. It should feel completely smooth, no rough spot. Um, nothing should be sloppy. It should be loose, but not sloppy. If you've got a sloppy flipper, you've probably got wear on one of the cams. Um, if it sticks, you may have a mushroomed uh, slug, the armature, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah. coil stop. No, well, if the coil or, stop is missing the, 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 the little rubber, you're going to be slamming metal to metal, and that can mushroom things. Sure. Um, yeah, but the, the, the part that's sliding inside the coil, um, the, well, oh, yeah. The, yeah, the, in, in most um, people's case, the plunger, if yes. You it's do an not, if you do not, if you bump into a machine that doesn't have a coil sleeve, that's bad. You need to rebuild that flipper. Um, it's not uncommon for an operator to go, oh man, that thing's wearing. <clears throat> All right, it, it's starting to bind up. Well, I'll pull the sleeve out with a pair of pliers because it didn't want to come out. Oh, now it, it, it works okay now. And you won't come back. And well, yeah, it kind of works for a little while. This, the, the coil is swelling. Um, you've just taken out a little bit of tolerance, so you've got a little play until it freezes up or it wears. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, we, we, we see that quite a bit, and we've also seen uh, recently where the uh, coil sleeves, um, I, don't wanna, I don't know how to say it, they have an edge on them. So they, they kind of go in one way, or they're supposed to go in one way one, only. One way only, they'll, they'll have a little ridge. Um, some of them will have a flange that comes out and there's a little bit more that sticks up. Flange, that's what the word I was looking uh, it, It's all nylon, it's just, it's just plastic, and that can come off. Um, so the sleeve's kind of floating in there. That, that's not good. Uh, we've, we've just looked at a, a F-14 Tomcat that had that problem. It looked like, well, wait, they used the wrong size sleeve. Well, no, the, the thing had broken and it was moved up and the, the armature was cutting the, the coil sleeve. Yeah. Well, okay, that obviously didn't need to be rebuilt. And it, was, it was binding up the flipper, not, not, to a, not to a point that it was unplayable, but to a point that Sometimes it worked, and sometimes it, well, yeah. it worked a little better. Coil sleeves are cheap compared to coils and to flipper rebuild kits. Um, they're kind of a pain to replace. You've got to disassemble a lot to be able to get everything apart, to put a new one in. But if you don't like working on these, it's going to be expensive because you're going to be paying us a lot. Um, we'll be glad to do it, but um, yeah. Sure. It, I don't work on my car though, you know. It's all about what you want to do. He tells me what to do on my car, shit. I still end up working on my car. That's right. Uh, routine maintenance on a, on a pinball machine will, will save you so much money. Uh, routine maintenance of, of replacing the rubbers when they get worn. Uh, cleaning, can't emphasize cleaning enough. Um, and not with Windex. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking. Ammonia D equal death. Uh, no, Novus, or uh, yeah, Novus number two. Novus is okay. Um, you, uh, the, the, 
depending on who you talk to, use Wildcat or don't use Wildcat. Yeah. Um, yeah, pick, kind of, it's, it's, it's up or down, kind of pick it. Question? Just a little bit. You probably got, you probably are into strokes or out of adjustment. Uh, you're going to be dropping full coil voltage while, during hold. Um, you need to, this is the case, you're going to have to test it with the, the play field live. With, yes, Bill? I was going to add to that that's all. Oh, okay. The, well, like like what what Bill is trying to say is that be, between David and Bill, they've they've kind of given you the whole answer there. And the whole answer is that your if your end of stroke switch is not uh, properly set, and properly set is approximately an eighth of an inch at full stroke. Um, that's that's why your coil is heating up is because it's not dropping the voltage fast enough. Or, you, or possibly you may have the wrong coil in there. Uh, or your coil could be going bad too. You, you could have a couple of shorted windings, which is gonna cause it to draw differently. Um, if it's both of them doing it, you might have a power supply problem. But that's kind of rare if they're working at all. There, um, if, it, if it's a WPC, it, it won't have the same issue. Right, if it's electronics, it'll be a little no, bit different. A little, little um, bit different. Uh, um, there are there are some new aftermarket coils that are out there, and they are just garbage. Uh, they they have a white label on them. Um, they have a white label on them, and I think they say flipper coil or something uh, in black. Th those things are garbage. Uh, I don't know who's making them. Uh, I know Marco sells them. Those uh, that's not the only coils they sell. Those particular that particular brand of coil, they're garbage. Yes, that's, that's yeah. that is exactly correct. I, and again, I had that exact problem on Elvira. I had a bad um, linkage in between the armature uh, and the flipper. And it, every time I looked at it, it was fine. And I made, of course, that mistake. And, and then when I did it correctly, I went, wait a minute, there's a whole bunch of slop in here and I'm missing end of the stroke. And that's why I kept blowing the fuse. I want to do one quick, I, I forgot this uh, when I was looking at my tool bag. So this, mm -hmm. most everybody has seen one of these. Have you ever seen Mad Max? He's got a couple of them hanging on us. This is a crescent wrench. This is a tool of last resort. It's also a tool of stripping out bolts. Um, I keep it just in case. Sometimes I'll need to hold something and I won't have this the right size times two. Um, just be careful with them. Uh, we're on time. Uh, thank, thanks, everybody. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring up Bill Whistle, and he's gonna discuss uh, playfield clear coating. And he's a little shy about this. Uh, <laughs> he he loves to hear himself talk, but not to, to people he doesn't know. So he's 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 a little new, a little embarrassed. And uh, but let me tell you, the guy can clear coat a playfield. So uh, come on up, Bill. Let's see what you got, brother. Come on, Bill, and steal uh, we'll my get, mic. We'll get Mike up here, and he'll mic you up. Oh, oh, we do. We have a break. Oh, okay. Perfect. Outstanding. <laughs> Again, thank you, everybody. <laughs>